Hi, we're back. Um... <laughs> Hello, everyone. I've taken over Isla's channel for the afternoon, and I've got Isla here with me and Robbie Travers. Welcome <laughs> to Isla's channel. <laughs> Excellent. I've missed you, boys. Here we go. So, How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I've missed you genu genuinely. We haven't done this for ages. We haven't done this in a long while. It's been, um, we've both, we've all been pretty busy, to be honest, but um, there's so much to talk about with all the, you know, crazy uh, Hillary Cass stuff. And obviously the Newsnight uh, episode that went out last night. So I thought it'd be really nice for us to get together and have a bit of a blether about what's going on. Always good. Did you, Always um? Good. so what was your impressions then? Uh, I mean, I, I, I actually found it hard to sleep because I was kind of hopping mad, but um, kick us off, Barry. Well, I, it, it's um, I, it was a quite extraordinary piece, um, to see to see it laid out in in such a way. What what I was bothered by, as you can imagine, and I'm sure any of my jesterites will know, was it didn't start by saying, "Please remember, everybody, that the gender identity doesn't exist." Mm. You know, and that, it's it's this whole thing about pampering to this ideology, and it's all done in a very lovely and kind way. Some of it, um, and it it sort of it. It places itself as trying to do the right thing, and the, in, and Gids has done this, and Gids has done that, and Gids has done the other. Well, I mean, I've got serious concerns about Cass, which I've said mentioned to you before about the fact that this is not going to go far enough, and I can't believe that what they've done in Newsnight is to frame the entire thing around the concept that gender identity actually exists, mm. but it doesn't, and I think that's the most worrying aspect is that historically they're completely inaccurate. I mean, you can't stop. You know, if they talked about John Money at the beginning. And then to explain how this stuff has been brought in by the Beaumont Society and the Yogi Garter principles and all the other nonsense that these men have been doing, then it wouldn't have made any sense to watch it afterwards because it would all sound like a bunch of lies, which of course it is. Mm. We just simply have children with distress. Mm. But to see that and then to hear that this chap at EPAF had made accusations against Baroness Faulkner was extraordinary. I've got a, I have a video on that. It's on my channel that I've done, but it's, it, I, I literally was, what? What did mm. he say? nepotism um and uh this guy saying well it's what we're doing already i mean i'm very worried by the fact that what we've got is the same people who caused the problem in the first place their belief in gender ideology ideology coming to the fore their belief in the gendered identity or gendered soul in the flesh sack is still there and they're and they're couching this in that lie to begin with so the lie is there's a gender identity. There's not just people simply in distress, particularly children, but there's a gender identity and they've run with it. And by doing so, have made the whole thing feel like a both sides issue when it's just simply an issue of right and wrong. Mm. That's where I'm at. Mm. It's really difficult to know which direction to go in with it. And I'm trying really hard not to get stuck on on the level of responsibility that even even though the BBC have, are, are obviously, you know, um, being you know actually talking about it now the level you know they they are still contributing to the discourse of the trans child and uh the, you know that puberty blockers are acceptable for some people and they're you know they're taking part in in the the whole ideological capture um and the fact that this is you know some kind of hegemonic type of um you know position where if we put any critique or analysis in in place essentially we're still going to be transphobic bigots etc but you know putting that aside the fact that that i find that in, utterly enraging um you know i hate to say that we've that i was saying all along that that, that cast was not going to work because of the position that she's taken but it's a bust it's a complete bust but listening to um this guy, Professor Gary Butler, was just quite astonishing. And I think it was um, really, um, you know, brave of him to do that and to come out in that in that um, in that platform in front of all of those people. But that just shows you how how much they don't care. And I think it was really a revelation for them to just go all out and it kind of fits in really nicely the other thing I want to talk to you about, because basically, if you if you slide all these things together, um, the move towards this embodiment goal um, thing, because essentially what they're saying is that we no we no longer need to worry about the fact that we don't have research because we do, this isn't a medical matter. Um, you know, this is not this is essentially just a lifestyle choice. So stop talking about the fact that we have low levels of of uh, you know epidemiologically valid oh. um, evidence base, uh, and let's just move past that. So you know. 
uh, it's difficult for me to organize my thoughts because there's so many different things to say about it. But, you know, but what did you think when you initially saw it, uh, Robbie? I think actually it's very interesting because for me, the answer is in the question. And there was one killer line that the BBC obviously left in that they didn't really think about, which was NHS England concedes there is no long term evidence of any long term effects. There is no evidence of long term effects of puberty blockers. Mm. And I sat there and thought, that's a very interesting concession that you have put out there, that we have no long term evidence. Brilliant. Mm. that's something that now I don't think they should be comfortable conceding mm. because then what we heard was the story of M which was very interestingly presented but I think it got to a very interesting point when we talk about experimentation because what was done with M was obviously for those who haven't watched I would recommend going and watching Newsnight obviously it might not be available to those who haven't or on the iPlayer uh, for such a long time so what I will say is that for those future watchers, what was happened with M was M has prescribed puberty blockers. Uh, the first injection was at the age of 12. This continued for a significant period of time, at which point M's puberty didn't actually stop, simply was slowed and had complications. So then they increased the dosage of the puberty blocker, at which point then that continued to the then prescription of a beta blocker and then subsequent to the prescription of a beta blocker one day in school M collapsed. Now that was fascinating to me but then what came next was a link that I don't think Barnes made and I think it was sloppy not to make this link. After the collapse there was no contact from GIDS. Mm. There was absolutely no contact from the NHS after this collapse from the gender identity service that had provided the drugs that is heavily suggested by the program and I think is highly likely to have caused the collapse. Now the question here becomes, and also as well, M M has not moved forward with transitioning in any way, either legally or in any way physically, and that will be recorded in any way because Gibbs have had no contact with M over that period since that collapse. Mm. So, the, so the question here becomes, experimentation is done often with a keeping of results. That's fairly key to experimentation. I can't even insult this by calling this medical experimentation mm. because results are not being taken. And that's really quite shocking. Results are not being taken, but not only that, how can we expect a heavily beleaguered service that is working in what we will suggest is ex not really experimental medicine, but something even worse, essentially an equivalent of alchemy, I would even suggest. We then expect them to ever improve if they are never, ever taking notes of those who have been in their care, who have desisted or had medical problems and are having no clinical contact post-medical issue. And I think from that perspective, the rest of it, and I know this sounds slightly um, dismissive, but the rest of it's all noise, because these are some very vulnerable people having some very real health consequences. Well, in fact, um, I don't know how old this girl was, but she did make reference to the fact that she had had um, no sexual um, interest Um which it was a kind of small comment, but it did give me some concerns. And also that she wanted it as well. That was, she said that she wanted to feel like other boys and girls do. She wanted right. to be attracted. She wanted to find a partner, but she's never had that urge. So we Again, obviously know that that could be, you know, an, an outcome for, of the puberty blockers. So I think it's, it was, it, there was another glaring thing as well, which nobody else has picked up on yet. So I'm happy to pick up on it. Do it. Um, which I thought was absolutely extraordinary. And again, you're talking here about the embodiment, the idea of the embodiment of this yeah. created this created creature with an identity, which is what M was attempting to do. Mm. And and the M was 19, I believe. I think that's what they said. Okay. The report, right there. Um, was that there was M playing Fallout? Right now, in Fallout, you can design your own character, be it male or female. Oh yes, that's correct. Right? Now, do you yeah. remember that she was saying about yeah, that? Yeah, the and book. I think, no, I'm not. I'm not saying that that M. M thinks she's a character from Fallout. I'm saying that with somebody who is perhaps in M's case a little geeky, um, you know, looking around a room, it could have been it could have been my room. 
all the games and this and the Pokemon, and, you know, all the sorts of stuff that my friends like. And because uh, we're geeks, now it's possible that M may not have had an enormous amount of social interaction with others, in which case their 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 perception of what it means to be a human being is going to be skewed. But they do think that they are able to do what they are doing in Skyrim, and that, you have to remember when they make a piece of media, which is what they made yesterday on Newsnight, that nothing is by mistake. Mm. So that was in there for a reason. Mm. And it was in there for a reason to illustrate that, that she connected her desperate attempts to find who she is with a game in which you can decide what your character is going to be. She did, she did pick that male, that strong male. Um, yeah, that, yeah. that strong male influence. Now, mm. that's not the fault of the game in any way. It's a brilliant game. That's one of the best ever made. But it's it certainly there's something there about a conversation around, hang on a minute, because it strikes me that M is doing what a lot of people who are involved in this particular business are doing, which is M is curating her life rather than living it. Mm. So what M is doing is collecting obstacles around her, or not obstacles, articles and things around her and ideas around her that allow her to create a subjective false view of who she is. Mm. And she is not then therefore having to face the reality of who she is. And by doing so, she has removed herself from her own humanity. And I think that as well as puberty blockers, that may, may well be a reason why she doesn't feel attraction to others. Mm. It's very hard to love other people if you don't love yourself. Mm. Um, it was, you know, just sort of going on to uh, Gary Butler and the uh, points that he made within his uh, presentation. Um, I mean, it was kind of a startling level of points in terms of how much he was trying to sell out uh, Hillary Cass and he made some really quite disparaging points even just about her being a retired um uh, I can't remember what what was it you said you know, a retired clinician or something some, it was some kind of you know he basically dismissed her uh, from the get-go um but you had some interesting observations about that Robbie didn't you um yeah, I mean, I, personally, I'll just start with by saying he needs to resign because he has made serious allegations against an individual with no evidence and now has backtracked quite spectacularly all those allegations, provided no evidence for them. So he needs to resign. But I think regarding what Butler was saying in particular, I think it's very dangerous for him to continue in any way leading this. Because Butler is approaching this from an end goals perspective. He, Butler is objective, he has his objective noted, and Butler is essentially going to find every single way, as we saw from that video and as we've heard from the conference talk at EPATH, he's going to find every single way to draw the process to his preferred conclusion. Someone who's fit to practice, in my view. And I think it's really quite concerning. I think the second concern about Butler as well, and it's something I particularly noted, is that he's accusing Cass of nepotism for choosing hospitals. He's saying as he would far rather have it in hospitals in which he practiced it. Now, that's, absol that's absolutely you know, interesting because, firstly, it shows that he doesn't actually understand the process. And this is a question of competence. Because if he did understand or engage with the process, he would know that the recommendations of which hubs to choose, which regional hubs to choose, was not made by Hillary Cass. So this individual is not only ill-informed, firstly, so therefore is not engaging with the process competently, but he's making allegations of nepotism, which have no basis, purely from a basis of incompetence. But I would say that that's also from malice. I think when it gets to such a point, you have to examine and say, is this individual fit to lead the process purely from a <laughs> professional point of view? I mean, we have obviously ideological objections to this chap. I would hope many sane people do. But on a professional basis, I would say, no, I'm afraid you have to walk. The other thing that I thought was very interesting, and as, as Barry said, nothing was left in for uh but, but, well, nothing is a mistake in these media forms, was M saying this has to be a clinical, psych uh, sorry, a psychological and mental health-led approach. And her mother also repeated those comments. That was quite interesting because if we throw out the suggestion that there needs to be a, a holistic understanding of transness, which is um, a dodgy understanding at best, if we throw out that idea, we then have to come at this from a serious perspective of, okay, on what perspective are we engaging with 
clinical psychology. And I'm afraid, you know, Butler points out as well in several other articles that he's written, there's not enough funding for mental health support. That may we be the case, and I think a lot of people who can see that is the case in NHS. Fine, but that doesn't mean you go, okay, it's time for the blockers, get the metal song on, roll mm. up your sleeves. Mm. This is this is essentially what seems to be happening here. It's a Martin Bailey approach. There's no mental health support. Mm. Oh, well, they need the blockers. And then mm. you say, well, okay, what if we provided that mental health support? Oh, well, they need the blockers anyway. It, it, it really is a retreat between two, an oscillating position because they cannot in any way defend this. But I think I think Butler really does need to walk. And I actually think, I, I don't necessarily always enjoy quoting this man with a positive uh, remark, but Sajid Javid is absolutely right. If you are not committed to the reform of the system, mm -hmm. then you should not be in any way involved in the reform mm -hmm. of the system. Because essentially what this man is doing is saying there is no problems with the system. The report is strange in its conclusions, but he doesn't actually go into any depth on why. And that's the other problem. All of this from Butler, I feel, is essentially trying to cast aspersions on Cass without actually having any solid evidence of why Cass might even be wrong, which is going to be very interesting. I think that Butler will come undone because I think his real problem here is that he has no real grievance apart from the fact that he cannot continue to be the lead. He's essentially trying to position himself as the lead because he doesn't want to be irrelevant. You know, as a, as a you know, child endocrinologist, mm. um, he's a paediatric well, endocrinologist. Mm. He's going to be a very, very relevant person if there is an ability to fiddle with children's endocrinology on a massive scale. Absolutely. But if there's not, yeah. Oh, he's he's a bit obsolete, isn't he? Oh, so I, I think there's a bit of I think there's a great deal of self interest there. I think that came across. I think it's just going to be a question of where I, you know, firstly, is anyone involved in the NHS? And I'm not a fan of Sparkly, and I've told you that before. And um, will he have the spine to say, hmm, I'm afraid these comments have seriously undermined a colleague in public in the process of a review? and have made false allegations about her with no evidence, which you have now contradicted. I think it might be time for you to walk. We'll have to see if that will happen. But I really do think that this is a little bit of a time for a certain minister maybe to uh, find a spine, I'm mm. afraid. He, he's absolutely reliant on puberty blockers being on the table, but then many, many people are offering him that option anyway, including Hillary Cass, um, which is entirely problematic in and of itself, really. Well, I, I, I said this just very briefly, Isla, back at the time, um, when Hillary Cass essentially said that the NHS and these satellite services and hubs should continue to treat children who have gone through gender GP, she called it continue their care. Yeah. That was extremely concerning. Because essentially, if you look at it from this way, as a child, who, uh, as a parent who has been recruited into the ideology, scared of the ideology, I don't want, and is getting advice, do you listen to the media, which is saying there are sometimes a six, seven-year waiting list for trans treatment? Or do you go and visit Ashula at her cauldron singing, poor unfortunate souls, it's true, it's sad, this one wants to be thinner, this one wants to be a girl, and do I have them? Yes, indeed. Do you visit Dr. Weberly and a few potions, and all she wants is your voice, your fertility, and probably a few other little things, including your bone strength. But the point is that this is, this is something that we have to seriously think about. If you're a parent and you are not in the kind of position that we are and know the danger, et cetera, and you're sitting there and you go, along comes Dr. Wibberley, we're doing the poor unfortunate souls act, you know, shaking around, talking about body language, you get the whole idea. But to a parent, you go, oh, well, maybe she will help me because she's just going to give me what the NHS might give me in a few years. Maybe she really will help my child, and, and, and she'll help my child now. All, all it costs is a few a few pounds. Mm. I'm having to pay for it, but it might actually really help my child. Mm. And at that point, you see the legitimization of a very dangerous individual. And, and she won't be alone. There will be other little um, kind of tricksters and con artists selling hormones. And I think that was a serious mistake. I think the care, but that's why the care had to be defined as serious, assessment 
and mental health support for individuals who have gone through gender GP. I mean, that should be standard for anyone who deals with Dr. Weberlin. I'm happy to put that on record and she can come visit me if she's not very happy, but I think that's genuinely the truth. Yeah. Barry, what are your... Um... Well, I think, I think, I think it revealed um, everything that you've discussed, but I also think it revealed more yeah. um, from the point of view of this guy talking. I, I was particularly interested in what happened at four minutes into the conversation I heard. Mm. Um, which was where he nearly said we're having trans education instead of education. Mm. Um, he's talking about education being managed by the Royal College of Pediatrics. Well, the Royal Colleges, as far as I can tell, are completely captured by this nonsense. So what they're talking about is they're going to educate people. Well, who are they going to educate? Well, they're talking about educating the people that are going to work in the service, in which case I want to know the name of every person that's involved in that education. I want to know, does this link back to Yogyakarta? Does this link back to Press for Change? Does this link back to the Beaumont Society? Does it link back to all of these people, to Chegley and everything else that comes with it? And who's pulling the strings in the NHS? Mm -hmm. Right, so I think there's some work that needs to be done on that, on, on bringing that to the fore. And also what I was interested by was the idea of education. Well, I think that they're gonna educate this, but they, they've already said that they, they live in this rarefied nonsense. They've already agreed that the original lie is okay, that gender identity exists. We know John Hopkins ditched it in the 80s when they knew how dangerous it was. They were the ones to do the original transitions. So this idea of a gender identity is, is already built into this. Now, I've been told off by Clive before, and he was right to do so, in saying that there are going to be people who need language to understand it. Well, I would agree with that, but I would say that what we have here is a situation where we need a triage. I mean, this is like MASH. These are people who are coming in who are in, who are in, who are in deep trouble because they, they're involved in a war. Now, I get told off by my warrior teachers for using the language of war. And they you did, oh, can't you do it? Well, actually, I think it's a perfect he's analogy. Not, he's not old enough to know what MASH is, probably. Do you, do you know MASH? I know what MASH is. Oh, I'm, uh, that's, that's a shocking imputation. I know okay, exactly what MASH is. <laughs> that's Gary, worse than what I've said about Wibberley. Yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah. talking to you now. So, uh, you know, from that perspective, I was having a conversation with a friend last night who, who was saying to me that in order to stop using puberty blockers, we, we need scientific evidence. I said, no, no, you don't need scientific evidence to tell you to stop experimenting on children. What the hell are you doing? Right. So, so that, that was my take. Um, and he's right about the scientific evidence. But I think from my perspective, it's the education I'm worried about. And if you're triaging this, now they're saying there's 8,000 people waiting. Right, okay. So let's go, right? Let's split those 8,000 down, shall we? We'll start there, okay? So we've got 8,000 who are under the age of 18. There'll be a very small proportion of those who are, who are, who are the original, if you will, terribly effeminate boys that presented in the 70s and 80s with this particular problem. So let's put them to one side. You've got them, right? So the rest of them are ROGD, so they're LARPin. Right. Or they've got other mental health issues that are serious. So you can put them to one side and not bother with them at all. So I don't think it's anywhere near 8,000. I think it's probably near 80. Right. The queue, is, the queue is filled up with nonsense merchants. Now, that's not to say the people that aren't in the queue aren't suffering and that they have problems. And they have serious issues. But if you're going to triage this, I think the first triage should be a day's education about John Money, about the lies of the Beaumont Society, the con of the Yoga Carter. That's what the education should be. And it should be for the individuals who wish to access the service. Mm -hmm. If you wish to access this service, you need to go on this day's course about exactly how this ideology came to capture people. And you need to understand what it is, what it does, and why it's not a good idea that you are part of it. Well, that'll mm. take out another 20%. Mm. Right? So then you have to triage. Is there abuse? Are they looked after? Is there autism? Is there ADHD? What other mental problems? What's going on in their home? What's the social issue? And I, it strikes me that this is the route that Cass is taking. <clears throat> it strikes me as the idea is that we place so many blockers in the way of the blockers. So we're going to block the blockers, right? But what you what you're going to end up with is a situation where nobody takes them because I don't think anybody should be. So that's that's because otherwise you you give the trans child reality, which we can't do. So I think that triage needs to be done in that way. My concern is that they're saying they're going to educate with the Royal College of people. about what? This isn't a medical issue. I'm sick of saying it. It's not a medical issue. It's a cultural, educational, and intellectual issue. It's is not a medical one. There is no such thing as gender identity. Therefore, there is no such thing as gender dysphoria. There is only people in distress, in this case, the ones we're concerned about, children. Now, nobody on their right mind would not say, let's eradicate children with mental health issues. Let's eradicate those mental health issues. 
I'm sure everybody can get behind that. We want to find, is there a way to stop this from occurring at all? That's what we need to look at. What we don't need to look at is expanding a service that requires endocrinologists. It doesn't require endocrinologists. It just requires decent teachers. Then you look at therapy. That's my take. I think the whole thing needs to be taken out of medical hands altogether. <laughs> But there's nothing wrong with, I mean, that take is uh, essentially one I would completely agree with, but obviously they would call that um, conversion therapy. And I love the idea of your, of your day. Um, the idea of the triage uh, amuses me as well, because I can visually see it as a clinician. Um, but I think a lot of other people can't, they just kind of put, they push out these words. I also think that gender critical people um, are so are invested in this whole brand of of um gender gender dysphoria being you know because of course there are some people who you know for, for are real real trans people and real gender dysphoria oh, and yeah. oh no 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 that's all bollocks okay stop saying it it doesn't it, it doesn't stack up and if you really got into the detail as you just <laughs> alluded to of what triage would look like if you actually took out all of the different uh, young people children so let's actually the other issue is obviously people keep saying young people they're actually children <clears throat> gary butler did a bit quite a lot of that <clears throat> if you actually went through your triage your virtual triage and took out all of their comorbid issues you would actually have no no one left absolutely <laughs> so yeah. you know the the this just it, it's fantasy land and and i have to say this is one of the problems with um a kind of social analysis, social commentators putting on in place something which basically just doesn't stack up in terms of the medical model. Because what the other thing is that people are not realizing is that that medicine is really a very closed shop. They do not look outside uh, at what other people are kind of advising them and commentating. This is really probably incredibly shocking for them that the fact that the rest of the world is actually talking about what they're doing and trying to interfere in it because. Um, it hasn't really happened for a very, very long time that so many people have had their eyes on one big issue that they're getting up to. Um, and I imagine this is why they're not really reacting publicly as well, because, they, you know, they're just it's just unprecedented. Um, but this is why they all these lobby groups, you know, like GLAAD, et cetera, are just managing to have such big impact. But <clears throat> structurally, if you think about all the different um, uh, uh, exec level uh, people who are signed up to to people like Stonewall, et cetera. Um, you know, this this can't we can't underestimate the impact that this is having in and all these gold awards. Um uh, because we're never going to get away from this allyship and how many, you know, maybe the, the, the small impact of of um these every post that you see, you know, on Instagram trying to get another medical school signed up to their charter. Um, you know, Rebecca uh, says no. I think she, you know her, she's incredibly good at trying to point out these very sort of small changes as they go along. But, you know, every single medical student who's coming out now is entirely uh, signed up. So n at no point has anyone um, ad ad approached the issue of medical capture. Um, it's almost getting to the point where we are at a lost cause. Um, I think I think as well, Isla, one of the things about medical capture is even if they aren't fully captured, again, we are going through the route in which I actually think it's almost entirely impossible in many careers, including professional careers, to be what I would call trans negative, which is to entirely suggest that there is no such thing as trans people, which is really quite concerning. And I've raised you with this with you before about the law society in particular talks about how you must have dignity and respect for trans people, you know, in the standards, et cetera, you know, standards of practice. Well, I think that not many I'm... practices are doing it, are they? <clears throat> not many people are actually just saying it like us. Oh, yeah. no, I agree. But that, but this is why I think, I think for professionals, there is a deep concern about, and many of them for their own careers, but what happens if I speak out? What happens with the standards? And the problem is that that's why I think GCDEM, if we're going to call it GCDEM, um, has a real issue because a lot of professional organisations say, well, yes, you can talk about limiting puberty blockers or concerns about puberty blockers, and yes, you can express concerns about gay children being taken to jets, etc. But you can't deny that trans people exist, and you have to respect trans people as a baseline. 
which is an issue. And I think it's what has led to an extent many individuals and individuals true transit. Now, the problem with true transit, that if you start suggesting there is such a thing as a true trans individual, you have to identify the moment of transubstantiation, both in law and in biology. And if you can't do that, your stance is nonsense. This is why a lot of true transers are immediately quite unhappy when you ask them, so at what point does a trans person become their new sex or their acquired gender? They can never really answer the question, and that's the issue here. But the problem is that the, our organisations demand that individuals be respected, and by that they mean that there is such a thing as trans and that be accepted, which I think severely limits the ability of individuals to criticise this. And I think it's something well, that, it, we need to acknowledge. Well, I think that I think what you're acknowledging there is pure identity politics. And I think what we're seeing, I mean, we've got to remember that the word trans is like the word vegetable. It's a collective thing. Right. So which ones do you mean? The parsnips or the turnips? You know, it's it, trans as a word doesn't mean a damn thing. And I think that's that's what we've got to first address is that um, when people talk about trans now, they say, well, you don't need a medical condition. It's not a medical condition. You just choose to be trans. Mm. If you saw that video of, uh, of of those three girls in Glasgow today, um, the absolute epitome of everything that is wrong. Every I mean, they literally are the poster poster people for it, really. You know, in that they are um, uh, the full-on toxically masculine, the full-on toxically feminine, and coming together as the toxic parent, illustrating exactly what gender is. And they really do illustrate that perfectly, is that we now have a situation where there is no definition whatsoever. It's, it's, it's now ephemeral. It doesn't mean anything. And therefore, because it doesn't mean anything, it can't be applied to anything as meaningful, in which case trans people don't exist. It's not complicated. <laughs> there are young there are children who have issues. That they are the mental issues that they need dealing with, whatever that issue may be. But when you look at people who are who are saying about this, the first thing they say is give us more money. That's the first thing they say, give us more money. Right? I'm not interested in giving them any more money. It's that simple, right? Okay. Take your kids out, buy them a new jumper, get them out get them out of the country, take their phone off them. Right? That's not that's that's the start. If you want to do it, that's the start. That's how you start, right? And then 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 start, you know, actually have some weight over them because they're children, right? They're not adults. So in terms of the children, we cannot feed them this lie that gender identity exists, despite the fact that the entire edifice of Cass and what this Palmer person has been on about seem to be predicated on the idea that we believe it exists. We don't. We don't believe it exists. It does not exist. It was a made up confection by John Money. And we know that John Money had his fingers in all sorts of pies. And then it came back to us via De Chegley, via Mermaids, via the Beaumont Society, by the Yoga Carter Principles and everything else that was based upon the idea that what we were doing was a good thing. It's not a good thing. And its supporters are, without a shadow of a doubt, people who are narcissistically compassionate, which means that they do it because it makes them feel good, not for any other reason. And that, if you if you take narcissistic compassion and you put it together with righteous cause mentality, that's that's a recipe for psychopathy. All right now, Sam Vinkman talks about this. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, when he talks about victimhood movements. And victimhood movements attract psychopaths. And not only that, victimhood movements always end in violence always end in violence. And what we've got here is one great big fat victim at the moment. You know, now there might be a, a portion of people who are suffering terrible distress, but they're at the back somewhere going, excuse me, remember us? So the 8,000, I don't believe. I don't believe it. I think it's mostly LARPers. So what are we hoping is going to happen now, but given what we've talked about in terms of, you know, what Barry, what are your hopes for Cass? Uh, what are you thinking? Well, my, my hopes my hopes for Cass is that is that she's going to be allowed to do her job primarily. Mm -hmm. I've read the reports and there are stuff there is stuff in the reports that I simply do not agree with. But I would like to see that she's allowed to do her job properly. What I would also like to see is now that this has been revealed that this Palmer chap has said this and that there is obviously something terribly amiss. I want them to gut the damn places. I'm get mm -hmm. them out. Right? It's that mm -hmm. simple. Okay. You need to get people in. It's I, I have to go back to it because I, I believe it's true. This is first and foremost an educational and intellectual problem, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. it's because people because people have been lied to at school. They've been lied to on the media. They've been lied to on online. They, you know, Richie talks about this, doesn't he? About being online and what happened online. And M in in what we saw said about being online. We need a, a full on public education program that takes you right from Kinsey, right through money to Chegley, everything else that comes with it. 
And I would like to see the cash report widened. Now, that's not going to happen because, as you said, they will stick with the medical side of it. Well, that's the big worry. Now, mm -hmm. um, Tanya from Safe Schools Matters was in front of the select committee the other week where yeah. she was interviewed by um, somebody that looked like... Um, yeah. Well, I don't know what they look like, but you know what I mean. Yeah, it and it was, it, was utter, it was utter nonsense, but Tanya was very, very strong in what she had to say. And Tanya is calling for a public inquiry into the whole thing. Well, I would go farther than that. I think we need a public inquiry into the creep of postmodernism and this neo-Marxist ideology into everything. We've got to find out where these people mm -hmm. are. I mean, that sounds McCarthyist, doesn't it? Mm. You know, mm -hmm. and yes, that inquiry would need to be done in a way that meant we didn't descend into some kind of McCarthyist hell. But it, it certainly, we're, the, we're at the point now where medical students are believing this rubbish. Medical uh, institutions are signing up to this rubbish. People are still paying, paying Stonewall money. And government, government and civil service organizations are bullying the hell out of people just because somebody rolled their eyes or farted in the wrong direction. You know, this is so we need to get these weakening people out of our system so that we can continue to move forward as a first world country, helping the rest of the world have a better life, which is what we've been doing in case anybody hasn't noticed. So mm. we've got to get these people out. They are an absolute cancer on our society, mm -hmm. the only way to describe it, with their power and oppression grievance narratives. So mm. I'm, I'm hoping CAS will eliminate all of this completely in the end, but I'm hoping that we have a wider discussion and a public inquiry about how these people who are so obsessed with power and oppression and making people that people feel that they're worthless and involved in some kind of ridiculous fight, um, how we can get them out of the lives of, of children and young people so that these young people can knuckle down and achieve something and bring something good to the world. That's that's my hopes. Mm. I love your I love your optimism and your plan. <clears throat> uh, Robbie, what are you thinking? <clears throat> I mean, personally, from my perspective, I think that we have to introduce the triage system, as Barry's noted. We have to introduce that immediately. Mm. There has to be, a, I would say, there has to be a refocusing on what has caused the social contagion in the first place. We have to examine that. We have to examine the role of social media in doing so. In particular, we have to examine in particular how these services have been gained. And Isla, you'll know what I'm talking about, particularly with dealing with children. Um, there are entire Reddit lists on exactly what to say to NHS psychologists and what... I hate to say it, it is like a video game, and I don't want to um, cast any aspersions on gamers, but there are entire walkthrough lists of exactly how to deal with the NHS to find yourself on blockers as soon as possible and exactly what responses to say. That needs to be actually observed. It needs to be observed that people can game the system so easily. That means it's not a rigorous system. If you can produce a walkthrough list for serious psychological disorders, of exactly what responses to say at exactly what time to get drugs, I'm afraid that's not a rigorous system, and we know it. So we have to tackle that situation. We need to tackle also comorbidities. Now, increasingly, you are seeing people with the most horrendous level of comorbidities. We're talking six or seven psychological mm. issues, borderline personality, eating disorder, all of these in a mix. These individuals need to treat it first for these issues. Gender issues, I actually would say, are a side effect, often, in many cases, of these serious psychological problems. Regardless of that, it needs to then look at the capacity to consent. These individuals cannot consent to these issues. They cannot consent if they have so many serious psychological disorders and other mental health issues. And I suggest if you started treating for the others, you would rapidly find the gender nonsense evaporates very quickly. So those are two immediate things I hope, you know, are products of the CAF review. Uh, I would say that Butler has to walk, and I mean Butler has to walk immediately. And the reason I'm saying Butler has to walk is that he has accused the media of lying coverage of the Tavistock. He has dispatched the character of Hillary Cass with no evidence, of which he should at minimum apologise to Dr Hillary Cass. Because regardless of our ideological positions, and sometimes we disagree with Dr Cass, I do not think Dr. Cass is a malicious individual, and I think that she deserves the professional standards. And I actually think it would be a failing of the NHS mm. to allow a colleague to treat another colleague in such a way. Mm. That would be a serious and profound failing. That needs to be immediately remedied. Because if you allow this standard now, anyone who runs this service is going to be absolutely sniped by a young generation of, why are they not allowing him to become a unicorn? Why can't I graft that onto his head? You know, this sort of stuff will immediately come up. So we need to set the standards now. And I agree with Barry.
um, in particular about examining what I call cultural abolitionists and uh, ne essentially cultural nihilists. And well, let's, I, I say both of them, they're epistemological abolitionists and mm. cultural nihilists. Mm. These individuals want to reject evidence. I mean, Butler says this too. He says the media are lying. He mm. never identifies how the media have lied yeah. and told yeah. any untruth. So to finish up, I think that we have to have an examination of why is, and I mean, obviously this is a teaching issue that I would suggest everyone, if you are interested in, do sign up to Warrior Teachers with Barry, because he can probably <laughs> tell you a lot about it. This is not an advertisement, and I have not been paid. But um, these people want to destroy epistemology. They want to destroy knowledge. They want to destroy the very basis on which learning is built. And how, essentially put it this way, these people want to destroy the process of understanding how we know things. That is yeah. the very fundamental truth. To do so, they will destroy anything in their path. Mm. Barry obviously teaches a lot of how to deal with that, but you genuinely should become more and more aware of the standards that these people are trying to destroy are the very standards by which our world operates and people are protected, kept safe, and we actually have an understanding of how to better ourselves. I think the best thing ever said, and I'm trying to I'll find who said the quote so you can star it, is the only ever become more intelligent by understanding how ignorant we are. Mm. I'm afraid these people are, I mean, I'll finish with the one quote that they often say, which is, how can you know me better than I do? Well, I'm afraid you've just thrown the entire um, in, in the entirety of clinical psychology under the buff for your feelings. I'm afraid we have to accept that there is such a thing as objective reality, that psychology has a basis and in fact you a small teenager who's 14 on tiktok may know less about your personality disorders that you've been cultivating uh, like a small marijuana um <laughs> a small marijuana plot in your attic etc so we have we have to essentially stop this attack on epistemology, this attack on knowledge this it is essentially in many ways Travis on the clerk which is um, academic reason from the French, but it is, and this is what it is, and anyone who's been involved in it, I'm afraid has to answer for what they have done, because they have embodied a powerful movement that wants to remove fact and have everything based on feeling. The problem is that what these people don't understand is, and to, to finish, these people do, do not understand that Feelings can be used against them. It's rather like the anti-monarchy protesters who had for years been campaigning to criminalise speech, going, well, but my speech, but I'm a good person and my speech is great. Ah, but it's caused offence, you see. Yeah, but my speech couldn't cause offence. That's only for people who are white skinheads or uh, might have a secret swastika tattoo. Oh, no, no, it applies to you too. And then these people suddenly realise Maybe criminalizing speech and trying to silence any form of discourse is a bad idea. Mm. Uh, I will. Um, I'll give you my little spin, <clears throat> which is um, that I think that um, CAS is a bust. Um, I think that I've said it before. I think the fact that they didn't take a public health approach was um, a, a really bad idea. Um, and a lot of people don't understand what I mean by that, but essentially that would have allowed them to take in uh, multiple levels, including, uh, you know, the school sector, you know, the interface, uh, the, you know, the kids. One of the issues with, uh, and I am often very sceptical about the way that the NHS works because of my background, um, the, the mental health crisis in terms of the infrastructure is a real issue. And when people talk about holistic care with regards to children and mental health provision, I think that that's um, a bit very pie in the sky because the crisis in terms of child and adolescent mental health services is off the scale, never mind the adult mental health provision. And so it's in, entirely fanciful. And in some ways, I think it's, it, it's very... Um, uh, it's very uh, um, helpful for them to go down a drug avenue because the powers that be know that there's no way that they can actually put mental health provision in place that would actually uh, seek to support these this number of young people if they really, really thought about trying to support them in any way with these comorbid problems. I also think that what will happen is that they'll um, in some way get this conversion therapy ban 
And then what I think will happen is that the medical professionals will say, now we're going to remove the need for a gender dysphoria diagnosis. So you, in fact, don't need that. And now actually what we're going to do is um, give, you know, we know that this is a, a lifestyle choice. You are actually born in the wrong body. So you can, we will just give you all the treatment that you want and don't worry about um, having to meet all of these, you know, standards and have this rigorous difficult assessment process um, because essentially we'll we'll push forward on the embodiment um, level of philosophy um, and Bob's your uncle. Um, I absolutely support um, Safe Schools Alliance who've been phenomenal um, on this um, uh, and the Family Education Trust who were on that, pub, that, that committee, Education Select Committee that you were talking about, Barry, um, and the calls for a public inquiry. As you know, the schools issue is, uh, you know, really close to my heart because I'm dealing with these parents every day. Um, this is an absolute car crash on both on both levels in terms of the NHS and, and the schools system, and we really can't separate them. Um, but, you know... I'm not feeling as hopeful. I, every, everyone who keeps saying be hopeful, it's not that I'm a person who is, you know, always got my glass <laughs> half empty, but I'm feeling really bad about this. You know, I, I started off feeling bad when I saw that, that what they were doing, um, but, you know, I've not been convinced otherwise. So, yeah, I'm okay. not good. Trans child is back, is still on the table, so is puberty blockers. Yeah, get them off. Get them off. Get them so, off. Thanks, thanks, lads. Uh, it's been good. We'll um mm -hmm. we'll speak again. Yeah. Great to see you both. Yes, we will do. Bye bye.